begin with a poem by the late great Danny Absey, Pythagoras' Song. White coat and purple coat, a sleeve from both he sews. That white is always stained with blood, that purple by the rose. And phantom rose and blood most real compose a hybrid style, white coat and purple coat, few men can reconcile. White coat and purple coat can each be worn in turn, but in the white a man will freeze, and in the purple burn. That poem really sums up why poetry is so important to medical school and the humanities in general. That really we want to combine the white coat, the clinical nature of so much of medical education, and the purple coat, the humanities, the passion, that indefinable something that just makes things come alive. Uh, now I spoke this morning a bit why one might want to engage with poetry and medical education, so I won't go into this in a lot of detail. Um, but obviously it's academically rigorous. It develops literary attentiveness, words, metaphors, imageries. It really matters. Um, I was worried about students that don't pay attention to spelling and grammar because I think they'll make terrible prescribers, for one thing. <laughs> But uh, that just that getting your ear into people's stories and the way stories work, incredibly important. Develops emotional intelligence and moral imagination. We value the content of the poems as well as the form. It enhances students' creativity, both reading and writing poetry. But I think the biggest selling point for me in the medical school is that it develops a tolerance of ambiguity. And what we mean by that? is that so much of medical education is about, still, is about the regurgitation of facts. The amount that students have to memorize and then spew forth in exams is still unbelievable. In spite of technology moving on, and we outsource quite a lot of our memories to, to devices, uh, but yet there's still very much that emphasis on learning and regurgitation, a very shallow form of learning. And uh, what worries me is that uncertainty is seen as a threat. And I think this comes to the whole scientific enterprise, really. That so much of the aim of science is to control uncertainty, to, to beat it, it out, really. And uh, the fact of the matter is that people are ambiguous. They don't always respond in predictable ways. Their bodies don't respond in predictable ways. And if we become over-reliant on protocols, on mnemonics. We lose sight of the assumptions on which those things are based. And then when things go wrong, people don't know how to cope. Here's an analogy. This is Exhibition Road. This is just, just down from Imperial College, the Science Museum on the right, and the, um, the Science Museum on the left, and uh, the VNA on the right. This is what it looked like about five years ago. Very normal street, traffic on both sides, pedestrians confined to the pavement. But those of you that have been there more recently will recognize this is what they've done with it. Uh, they've blurred the distinction between the road and the pavement. It's chaos. It's uh, cyclists, it's buses, it's coaches, it's pedestrians. And there's a high degree of uncertainty on Exhibition Road. Perversely, this makes it safer. By increasing the chaos in that situation, the cars have to slow down, people have to communicate, you have to look people in the eye to see what their intentions are. And it makes the whole road safer. So sometimes, just dealing with uncertainty in imaginative ways increases the safety of the situation. And of course, poetry is a wonderful way of teaching ambiguity, of teaching the uncertainty, drawing attention to it, the fact that there are multiple interpretations that you kind of need to defend in a classroom situation um, and find evidence for, I think uh, is, is a way of really addressing that. And as um, Epson said, the machinations of ambiguity are among the very roots of poetry. So the rest of my talk is going to focus on three things, the three R's, reflection, resilience, and resonance. And I'm very gratified to have heard 
the words uh, reflection and, and uh, resilience quite a lot already this morning. Catherine and Roman spoke very eloquently to that this morning. And one of the things, the clear message that came across is exactly what I've experienced, is that when you say to students, right, we're going to do some reflection, this is the response you get. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, when I we recognize Henry there. <laughs> when, um, when, I, when reflection first became, came to everybody's attention, I mean, I've been teaching this course now for 12 years, it was an exciting thing to do. It was really, it injected a bit of life into the classroom. And now, because it's become so required and a tick box thing to do, it's kind of taken the joy out of it. Most students, when faced with needing to do some reflection, have to sit down in front of a computer and fill out these boxes. It's no good. Uh, it's not imaginative, it's not creative, it's not fun. So part of my mission is to uh, re-inject some excitement into the whole concept of reflection. Because I'm not saying reflection is not valuable, it's hugely valuable, hugely valuable thing to do. But we need to tackle it in more imaginative ways. And uh, this morning Ellen mentioned The Inner World of Medical Students. I too found this incredibly useful book. It's got lots of very nice poems written by medical students and some really good analysis. So I do think that uh, poetry is a wonderful stimulus to reflection and you can use it to engage students in a different kind of way to the, the usual tick box culture. But also what's nice about it, and, and this also uh, came through very strongly in the talks this morning, is that it, poetry occupies that liminal space between fact and fiction. You can take on a persona in a poem that makes it far less threatening than if you just have to write from autobiographically. So by sometimes give, giving it a little bit of distance, taking on the third person, or writing the first person if you wish, but uh, the whole thing uh, is far less threatening than, than constantly having to write about yourself and your own emotions from a very raw point of view. One of the things that I'm doing in a few weeks' time, so this is top secret, is I'm taking a bit of a risk. I've been asked to give a workshop on reflection with some GP trainers, and um, I was desperate for something a bit more imaginative to do. So I have, um, I'm going to be giving them a, a, a booklet. I'm going to be pairing them up, and rather than sitting in a room and talking about reflection, I'm going to be sending them out into the environment. And I've got a whole map theme for this. And on each page is a little, little task to do, just a five minute task. I'll get a map on which they can map their professional journey, what have the mountains been to climb, what have the boggy bits, where, where have the woods been, and where's it been a little bit more easy going. Um, so I've got a whole sort of little, little goodie bag for them, creative things to do. You've got to make your companion a gift by the end of it, a little key ring to make. Um, and I'm also putting some uh, poetry in there so that they'll be discussing that poem that I read at the start, Pythagoras' Soul. And uh, I, I hope it's going to work. I think. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, but, but and also a little bit of take uh, take home kit. So when you get home, some resources, and I'll have some <coughs> not only poetry but also art because I'm going to get them to write uh, a reflective piece on on a postcard, just uh, hypothetically to somebody that's inspired them. Because I think role modelling is incredibly important. Um, right then, uh, resilience. So I think a perfect analogy for this is. Uh, is silly putty, really, um, because resilience means that ability to bounce back. Now, this is probably going to go horribly wrong, because the bounce is unpredictable, which is part of the point. Yes, it does bounce. <laughs> OK, and I've taken my inspiration from this book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow, what I like to think is humanity's fast and slow. So many medical students go, well, and this is through no fault of their own, but they do tend to come from very privileged backgrounds where they've been very much looked after, very close family situation, being nurtured by their schools. And I would not want to reverse engineer an unhappy childhood on anybody. And I certainly wouldn't want to imply that all medical students have never had any hard knocks. But the truth is that many students come 
to medical school without having experienced adversity, without having ever been exposed to death. People are living so much longer now. Um, whereas my great-grandparents died when I was a child and I had to deal with that. Uh, nowadays, many students are that much older when they first experience death and it often happens to them while they're at university. Um, so they, and this can be a real shock. This can really set people back. Personal experiences of bereavement seem to me, in my experience, the biggest uh, factor in uh, the way in, in interruption of studies or academic problems at university. Um, so, in a crisis situation, I'm not saying that you just that you always give a, a, a poem can solve people's problems, but I think it, it can help. It's kind of humanity's fast business. So, uh, you, but it can help people to take, take them outside of their immediate situation, give them something intellectual to provide, to, to provide some solace in some way. I think what we do have to remember though is that if we're going to say the arts are powerful, then we have to appreciate that they can exacerbate situations as well as ameliorate them. So one has to be a little bit careful. You don't give somebody necessarily a, a poem about death when they are grieving. Um, so individual responses to crises, crises, they do need to be subjective and bespoke and sincere. It's not a one size fits all. Humanity slow is the other property of silly putty. You get this wonderful stretch. And this is, I think, where teaching really comes in. If we can give students kind of some kind of prophylactic effect by exposing them to memorable literature, poetry, arts experiences, throughout their medical career, and when they do find themselves in crisis, then that can help, and they can remember that, oh yes, and this is how it made them feel at the time, and, and perhaps at the time it helps them to project forward into times when they will experience hardship. So humanity is fast and slow, I think, and help build resilience. I'll put that down now because it's too irresistible to play with. Um, so I recently did a workshop, again, with, with educators, uh, and we kind of talked, turned the form on its head a bit, we played with it in a creative way, and we got them to write a prescription for resilience, and it was nice because they all wrote what made them feel better, and then we played this game where you turn over the paper and you all add to it, and we had a few lovely collective poems as well, and this is the sort of thing that came up with. I prescribe lying in lemony sunshine in a wildflower meadow, because you are feeling overburdened with city concerns, your treatment contains activity ingredients and a blue sky daydream and should be taken as frequently as necessary. Possible side effects include hope and happiness. <laughs> Another problem that's been alluded to is this fact that we have to measure everything. There's a mantra in medical education that if you don't assess it, students won't value it. And this is a problem because the minute you start putting those kind of matrix onto very subjective experiences, students become very strategic about it and rather quite competitive. Um, and it kind of also takes the joy out of it. It also privileges the quantitative over the qualitative. And what it does is it reduces the possibility of unintended consequences. If you have to spell out all your learning outcomes at the start of the lesson and make sure you only stick to those, then uh, there's no possibility for actual magic happening in the classroom when you bring a group of talented, uh, intelligent people together and you give them some stimulus and you see what they make of it. So, uh, and these kind of papers are becoming increasingly common. How do we measure empathy? Uh, how do we assess and measure resilience? Assessing reflective practice, it all becomes very tick boxing. And I'd rather see those kind of measures that we talked of earlier. How do we, you know, does, do arts interventions reduce the amount of drugs people have to take? Do they reduce the length of hospital stays? Those are really meaningful. Trying to get a handle on empathy, for example, just seems to me to, to be a bit silly. And I find myself having signed it up to the kind of medical academy, as it were, being in a teaching environment. One has to go along with these things. One does have to assess work. But um, I feel it's my duty to resist some of the silliness, keep it to a minimum, and try and facilitate unintended consequences. The final thing I'm going to talk about is resonance. And there's this lovely 
quote, all the way from 1769 from Diderot, the sensitive vibrating string oscillates and resonates a long time after one is plucked it. It's this oscillation, the sort of inevitable resonance that holds the present object while our understanding is busy with the quality which is appropriate to it. But vibrating strings have yet another property, to make other strings quiver. And I think this is so important because this is my experience <coughs> of how humanities works in an educational environment. It just sets ideas off and they resonate and they resonate with the people in the room and they resonate with other ideas so it kind of has this uh, knock-on effect and it brings together memory and imagination and creativity. And the other thing that, well, there's, a, there's a wonderful book called um, Reason and Resonance by uh, Veit Perlman and he says that resonance is the complete opposite of the reflective distancing mirror um, and that uh, while reason implies the disjunction of subject and object, resonance involves their conjunction and it also entails adjacency, sympathy and the collapse of the boundary between the perceiver and the perceived. And I'm sure that you would agree that listening to the poems that were re read earlier, it kind of gets you here, gets you inside, it's not a distancing thing. Um, and it also brings together that sense of orality, that AU, a orality, the listening. And we've heard uh, so much lovely stuff about that today. Uh, John referred to it this morning in the structure of the ear. And this whole move towards listening rather than always talking and writing. And um, that empathic listening is incredibly important and we uh, ought to be emphasized because it's the, the taking into account the patient's story, but also your colleagues' stories and fellow students' stories. Uh, there's no coincidence that we talk of heart strings, because it almost feels like that when you hear a poem that really resonates, then it feels like uh, you've been touched from inside. And also that lovely hush, that stillness, when poems are read, and we've all experienced it here today, and you experience it when you read a poem to a class of students, everyone just becomes a little bit stiller and more attentive. There's so few spaces in our busy lives when that actually happens. It's just a moment to just live in the moment and for that close attentiveness to, to be able to happen. So this is kind of a visual embodiment of what resonance can do. It's dynamic, it's vibrant, it emphasizes the materiality of perception Danny Apsi called it Pythagoras' song. And that's not only because of the rhythm, but it also has that idea of that the hypotenuse is more than the sum of the two sides of the triangle. It's almost like a vibrating string there, creating resonance. So finally, you know, if one is going to attempt an answer to what is the role of poetry in medical education, I think it's that it provokes these sorts of responses. An individual response, that collective response, that sense of community that you referred to so nicely earlier. Um, it evokes an emotional response and a creative one, and also an intellectual one. And what more could one ask for, for a happy educational experience? Thank you. The talk you've just heard took place at a symposium on the day of the announcement of the awards for the 2015 Hippocrates Prize for Poetry and Medicine. The Hippocrates Prize is an annual award for a poem on a medical theme, unpublished, written in English, of up to 50 lines of text. There is an open international category, first prize £5,000, a UK NHS category, first prize £5,000, and a Young Poet Award prize £500.